that's the short URL to take you to this, the repository for the tutorial today, um, and then go ahead and clone that. Um, if you already cloned it before, uh, I accidentally forgot to include the data files in it until like 10 minutes ago, so thanks to whoever tweeted that to me that they were missing. The data is now in the repo, so if you did clone it earlier in the week, maybe do a git pull quick and you'll get the data files that you'll need. Uh, there's some setup instructions here. Basically, you can uh, CD into the Git repo. Sorry, I'll leave this URL up here a bit longer, but <laughs> CD in there, and then there's a conda environment.yaml file if you want to do conda env create. Um, that'll get you all the correct versions of everything you need. Um, if you're using pip virtual env, then there's some instructions further down on the page. But, uh, yeah, basically using Python 3 and uh, pandas, latest pandas, should be pretty good. So, give you a couple minutes to get that. Sorry, Wi Fi is also important if you don't have that yet. Just, uh, while we're doing this, if I could get a survey of experience levels, uh, who here has like first time programming in Python? Maybe a couple. Okay, great. Uh, who here has never used the Jupyter Notebook? We'll be using that quite a bit. Okay. Uh, and then new to NumPy, Pandas, that sort of stuff, but have programmed before. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, more experienced Python, PyData stuff. Okay. So this is an introductory tutorial. Um, it starts out uh, even more introductory, and then there's kind of a ramp about halfway through. So. Uh, Hopefully, hopefully it'll be good, but definitely do stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, it's meant to be interactive, so uh, please do stop me. I encourage you to work through the examples as I go through them up here. Uh, we can go through them, them together, and then throughout the notebooks there's some exercises that um, I'll have you do if you want. Okay, uh, anyone not able to clone this repo yet? Everyone able to clone it at the very least? Uh, Wi-Fi, okay. Do these instructions make sense? You have to go through UIC guest first and then put in one of those username passwords. Um, of people who are able to clone it, were you able to get the environment set up? See a few heads, yeah. Question or? Yeah, uh, so environment, uh, conda, and uh, virtual. PIP, whatever, virtual env. Um, there are basically ways of isolating uh, a set of packages uh, so that you can have multiple versions of like pandas installed on your computer without them conflicting with each other. So I just included this so that it, we, we don't have any dependency issues because uh, pandas is known to change their API from time to time. Any other issues? I think, um, okay. People who weren't able to clone it, have you succeeded getting on Wi-Fi? Okay, okay. Maybe give like one more minute and then we'll get into the first notebook. Um, for people who have successfully done that, um, but haven't used Jupyter before, so this is the repository if you CD into the pandas head to tail, and then um, make sure to activate your environment. So I think it's like source activate uh, pandas head to tail, or Activate PH2T, or if you're on Windows, I think it's just activate. Um, make sure you're in the right environment, and then you can start up the notebook server with Jupyter Notebook, and then we can get into the first notebook. Any issues on that? Just raise your hand. Yeah, having troubles? Looks stuck. Gotcha. Is Git Git slow? GitHub slow? I, I guess GitHub will throttle if too many people from the same network try and download the same thing. But hopefully it'll finish up. Um, the first uh, so the first notebook. I'm going to get into that now. Uh, it's uh, basically me just laying out the basics, so not too interactive. So as that download's finishing, you shouldn't be missing out on anything really. Um, so I think we'll get into it now. And if you are still having trouble, just raise your hand. Maybe Greg or someone will help you out, uh, get you going. So, okay, yeah. Are you having trouble, sir? Uh, 3.5. Um, although any 
version of Python 3 should work. Python 2 might work. I didn't test it though. But if you're using Conda, it'll install Python as well, uh, the correct version of Python. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get into it then. So, first notebook is uh, very introductory. So, if you haven't used Jupyter notebooks before, they're just you know interactive computing environment in the browser, um, tied to a kernel in this case Python to actually execute your code. So. Uh, there's two modes basically. There's an edit mode and a command mode. You start out in command to actually edit files to, you know, edit, ed, sorry, edit cells code. You'll hit enter to go into the cell. Um, you can hit escape to go back into uh, command mode to move around with J and K. And then to actually execute a cell, you'll hit shift enter. So that's how you'd be doing for the most part is just shift enter throughout and then writing your code in edit mode. Okay. Um, so the, the pandas is built on top of NumPy. That's like the core n-dimensional array library used in Python. Um, so it's good to know some of those NumPy-isms that leak up into pandas. Um, so the heart of NumPy is the n-dimensional array. This is a container, data container-like list, except their NumPy arrays are typed. So they all have a type. In this case, we have a D type of int 64. And they're also fixed width or fixed length. They have a shape. Um, and you're not going to be like appending onto them. They're fixed length. So NumPy provides quite a few types. You can look through the documentation, have a look at those. Um, I should, uh, how's the font size in the back? Can everyone see it? OK. Um, so NumPy provides all these types. Um, with respect to the type system, the biggest things to keep in mind are that missing values. Um, pandas uses nan, not a number, to represent missing values. We'll see this a lot. Um, but nan is a float. So if you have a column of integers and one nan, it's going to cast your column of integers to floats, which is unfortunate. And uh, it's going to be fixed eventually. <laughs> it's a big problem. Um, and then NumPy arrays also have a, a single D type for the entire array. So this is NumPy arrays. It just has one D type. So you can't have like a column of integers and a column of floats and a column of strings. It's one D type for the entire thing. Pandas solves that problem. And then object D type is the fallback, like Python objects, and you want to avoid that if you can. Okay, one of the um, important concepts behind NumPy is vectorization. So this is what lets NumPy go fast, one of the things. Um, basically, if you have two arrays, same shape here, um, Vectorization, the idea is to basically let NumPy do the work of actually like iterating through these pairs if we want to add these two together. In Python, we would you know, write out the for loop ex explicitly and then add each pair together. With NumPy, it's just x plus y. So that's vectorization. Um, it's you know, it's going to be faster, for sure, just like in NumPy and in Pandas. And it's also sometimes more convenient way of writing things. Sometimes it can be harder, though. Um, and then the last NumPy thing we'll talk about is broadcasting. So this, uh, this is what lets you do operations between arrays of different shapes. So you can think of, if we have x, this A range, okay, from 0 to 4, uh, you can think of a scalar 1 as like a zero-dimensional array. Um, you don't have to worry about reshaping that 1 to be the same shape as x to do operations. Same thing here with y. y is uh, 2 by 5, and you can do operations between arrays and scalars, no problem. And as long as the shapes of the two arrays are conformable, so basically what that means is that the last dimension matches, you can do operations between arrays, so of any dimension, as long as that last dimension matches, NumPy will take care of the broadcasting, and it basically just does what you would expect it to do. Okay, without that, you have to do all this like reshaping and re repetition stuff, so that's no fun. Okay. So that's NumPy in like five minutes. Uh, we, uh, we're going to do a very brief overview of the pandas data structures. Um, but I don't like, uh, you know, very, I don't, I don't like, I, I'd much rather do practical examples. So that's how we will be doing the majority of the learning here. Um, but before we get there, just to give a high level overview, overview of what pandas solves. Uh, first of all, labeled arrays. If you saw up here, these NumPy arrays, they're just arrays. Um, but most of the time, the data I work with have labels associated with them. Um, so there, we'll be seeing that quite a bit. Um, like I mentioned before, pan, NumPy arrays are homogenous. There's just a single D-type for the entire array. 
pandas data frames are heterogeneous, so you can have multiple data types in your table. Um, it has better missing ha handling, different. I'd say pandas is more practical about missing values are gonna happen, they're gonna be in your data set, and pandas has the tools for dealing with those. And then a bunch of convenient methods, we'll see uh, all of those. Data structures are like where every tutorial starts, right? So we had to follow suit. Um, the main data structure you'll be working with is the data frame. This is like a ta tabular, uh, two-dimensional, uh, in-memory table. And you know, the way they work basically is you've got the data in, in the middle of your data frame. Um, and then you have some column labels and you have some row labels. So these row labels are uh, very important. Um, they come up in a lot of things like alignment and then the first thing we'll talk about here, indexing. So selecting subsets of the data. So if you want to select a column, you'll use the regular Python get item square brackets and then just pass in the column label that you want to select. So we can select the column A. Um, if you want to select multiple columns at once, you can pass in a list of columns. So calls here is a list of columns and we select those two. For row-wise selection, you'll use .loc. So .loc says, uh, give me the row labels, lowercase a and lowercase b. And then you, you can do ranges and stuff like that, just like with regular Python list slicing, you can do ranges as well. Yeah. Uh, they can be anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, whatever you have. By default, they're gonna be integers, uh, zero through length of the data frame, but I explicitly passed in this ABC here. And um, yeah, let's just, one sec. Any other questions so far? Okay, um, so yeah, that loc is how you'll be doing that. Uh, the other way of selecting is by position. So that was by label. Uh, oftentimes it's convenient to select by position too. Like say if you wanted the first two rows, you'll use dot I loc. So pass in the integers, zero and one, uh, grab those first two rows by position. You can also do slicing and stuff on that. And you can mix these together, right? So the basic, the more general rule is dot loc, and then row labels, comma, column labels. Same thing with dot i loc. It would be row positions, comma, column positions. And you can mix these all together. But this is probably like the most important summary here is, you use regular Python get item, square brackets for selecting columns. You use dot loc, row labels, comma, column labels for selection by position, and then dot i loc for, or sorry, mix that up. Uh, this is for by label based, and then dot i loc for position based indexing. Okay, so that's data frames very briefly. Series are like the one dimensional analog of data frames. A data frame is a container for series. Uh, you saw them before, they're what you get back when you slice a single column. Notice that they have their index here though. They still keep the row labels. Um, you can get it in a lot of ways, square brackets. Um, Pandas attaches these uh, column names as attributes on the data frame, so you can do df.a, very convenient. Um, you just have to be careful not to shadow a data frame method. So mean is a method on data frame. So if you do df.mean, you'll get the method, not the column. If you have that shadowing, then you need to use the square brackets. Okay, um, I think we'll skip that. The last one is indexes. Uh, so these are the row labels and column labels. They're actually this other data container called an index. Um, so they're kind of peculiar to pandas. They're, um, R has row labels, but not in the same way that pandas uses their row labels with indexes. So um, indexes can be whatever you want. They're specialized types like date time index indices if you have uh, date time data, float 64, categorical index. Um, so we'll be seeing those throughout the tutorial. But for now, just know that indexes are your container for row labels. And they're, they're an object in their own right, okay? They're usually good to have. Uh, sometimes they can get in the way, but uh, more often than not, they're they're really useful. Okay, questions on that. Next notebook will be more interactive. That's just setting the stage. Yeah. Indexes are, unfortunately, we allow duplicates in the indexes. 
they, that can cause a lot of issues, um, but sometimes you need it. So uh, in general, I would say you want to have a unique index, and you can always check that with uh, like df.index.isUnique. Um, yeah, in general, you want to have unique row labels. All right, um, I should also say there's a uh, Gitter channel here. Um, so if you're having any troubles, uh, if you just click on this link in the main GitHub repo, this will open up a chat page thing where you can like post questions or whatever, solutions to your examples. All righty, um, so if you want to jump into the second notebook, operations. Was everyone able to get it cloned eventually? Alrighty, so the first half of this is more just talking and then we'll get into some actual exercises and some real examples. So data frame and series, like NumPy arrays, they support vectorized operations. Um, one of these is ufunc, so this is another NumPy thing. Uh, it stands for universal function, and ufuncs operate on any dimension array. So it's, it's because they operate element-wise, basically. They don't need any other information. They just go through element by element, applying their operation. So things like addition is a ufunc, uh, exponentiation, log. These are all ufuncs, and they all work just fine on data frames, just like they would on a NumPy array. Um, these are going to be much faster than iterating over your data frame. You almost never want to iterate over your data frame. It would be a lot slower. Last one, um, alignment. So this is uh, something, it takes some time to get used to, but um, it's extremely convenient when you're working with data sets um, with where your data is spread across multiple data frames. So anytime you do a binary operation between two data frames, like or a data frame in a series, uh, like addition, say, um, pandas is going to first align the two data frames and then do the operation. So in this case, and sorry, it, it aligns by labels by index and column labels. So for this one, they have the same labels. DF1 and DF2 have the same labels. So when you go and do the operation, it just does exactly what you'd expect, right? Same labels. Um, we'll make a new DF2. Notice that the we swapped the first two rows of DF2 here. So the index is now 201. Um, we can do DF1 plus DF2, and we get the aligned by label version. So this is the identical result to above. And that's because before doing the addition, pandas first aligned by label, it said, okay, these are the same index, but in a different order. I'm gonna reorder it to the DF1 version and then do the operation. So this can be extremely convenient because if you get deep into an analysis and you're just using like NumPy arrays, it's on you as the programmer to know that the row in this one matches with the row in this other one, which can be tricky when you're doing like group eyes and stuff like that. Pandas, much easier to let pandas manage that with the index labels. Um, and then you can have different index indices entirely. So DF3 now has some extra rows and extra column. Um, when you go to do that, pandas will introduce missing values, NAN. So when it aligns, it doesn't just reorder. It'll say, it'll take the union of the indices. It'll note that DF1 didn't know about row three or four or column C, so it introduces NANs there. And then NAN plus anything is going to be NAN. So you get NANs in the output. OK? Any questions on that? Yeah? Um, so Pandas does it automatically. So you don't really have the option to not align the two. Which, uh, yeah. There might be cases where you don't want that, but I'm struggling to think of one. Typically, you'll want alignment. OK, so that is it for me just standing up here talking at you. Um, we're getting to our first real application, and everything from here out will be actual real data. Um, first one will be looking at some time series data. Um, does this uh, next cell work for everyone? Everyone has all the imports, hopefully, working. OK. Um, so before um, I grab some data from Fred, the Federal Reserve Economic Database, um, I grab data on GDP, gross domestic product, uh, CPI, which is a measure of inflation, and uh, a recession indicator using the data reader package, Pandas data reader. 
and then you all should have this um, data here. Uh, does anyone not have the data? If you had an old clone before I pushed the data, I need to redo that. Yeah, having trouble? Greg, do you think you're good? Thanks. Um, okay, Greg's gonna come help you out. Okay, everyone else good though? So we can look at the first few rows here, um, and you can see that each, each one of these is the same thing basically. It has date uh, on the first kind of cell column there, and then the actual values, in this case GDP, uh, as a second column. So pandas, uh, most of the time you're not actually constructing these data frames by hand. You'll be typically reading them in from a data source. So pandas has a whole bunch of uh, read underscore methods. So you can read from clipboard, CSV, Excel, a ton of different options there. Um, read CSV is extremely powerful. Uh, last I looked, it has like 55 parameters, which is crazy and awesome. Uh, it, it can handle a lot of different badly formed CSVs. Um, so these ones are thankfully not too bad. Um, we'll just use the index call equal date. So this says use that first column as the row labels and then parse, parse that first column as date times. Uh, then we can look at gdp.head, that gives the first five rows, yeah. Squeeze, uh, sorry, that uh, turns it into a series. So if I just had this, if you have a, um, this is a data frame. Do you see the difference in the representations here? This is a data frame and it uses the HTML pretty rendering. Um, when I squeeze it, this is now a series and it's a, yeah, it's a series. So if you have a one-dimensional data frame, squeeze will turn it down into a series. Okay. This, since this is really one-dimensional, yeah. Yeah, so this is a, a, a question was, what does this question mark do? This is a Jupyter notebook or IPython thing. Or, yeah, Jupyter in general. Um, you can, it'll basically look up the help, the doc string, and then bring it up in this pager. So that is specific to Jupyter, not valid Python. Okay, uh, so we can look at the first five rows with head, last five rows with tail. Uh, CPI, again, inflation, and then the recession indicator. So there are a ton of different useful methods on data frames. Uh, we'll be using mean later in a second, so I wanted to show you that. Basically what this does is it just takes the average of in this case, we have the series, so it's just the one column. If you have a data frame, it'll do each column independently, taking the mean of each. There are a bunch of plotting methods. We're just gonna kind of skip over this, but make sure to execute the cells. Um, I only included this to get the nice, pretty recession, recession bar indicators there. Um, this is just some matplotlib stuff for the most part. All right, first exercise. Um, your, your task is to convert CPI to be base 2009. So CPI is an index, consumer price index, uh, which basically means it doesn't have any units. The oh, what, BLS, I think, calculates it. Um, and they just chose some year, or they chose 1982 to 1984 to be the index, which basically means they took the raw values for the entire series and divided by the average over 1982 to 1984. Okay, uh, let's say that we wanted to convert that to be base 2009. So um, what we need to do is select just 2009, just the values for 2009 out of CPI. So we have CPI here. You wanna select just the values for 2009 using those indexing things I talked about in the last notebook. And then take the average of that and then divide the entire series by whatever that average is, okay? So for each of these exercises, uh, I've left you some room here so you can go ahead and work on it, and then when you think you've got it, or if you get stuck, you can execute this uh, magic, this percent load magic, another Jupyter specific thing, um, and that'll load the solution for you. So why don't you take like 30 seconds, a minute, to try and do this. Uh, read through this, this'll help you out. There's a little bit of special uh, indexing magic for, for date time indices, when you have dates in your index. Makes it a little easier. Let's take a minute or so to work on that. And then I think there's a follow-up exercise if you want to calculate real GDP based on that last step.
Okay. Um, so to get the uh, average, or to select the values for 2009, we'll use dot loc, right? We're doing row label selection. Pandas has this nice syntax for selecting subsets of time series. You can just use partial string indexing. Um, this is really nice because you can do like, if I just want the first month, right? You can just pass that in. So we'll select the entire year. We'll use dot mean to get the average for that. And then we'll say CPI 09 is gonna be equal to that entire series, CPI divided by that, and then times 100 to make it uh, centered at 100. Any questions on that? If you were doing this, you have to execute the cell once to have the solution pop up, and then execute it again to actually run the cell. So that is uh, CPI09, and then if you uh, yeah, plot it, it looks identical pretty much, only the 100 is now here at 2009. Um, if you wanted to try and calculate re real GDP, so real GDP is nominal GDP, not inflation adjusted, divided by CPI, 09. And if you go to plot this, our GDP, you'll notice um, you get a blank plot. And that's because if you look at real GDP, it's got a real GDP, got a bunch of missing values, basically. So pandas, um, when we did that operation, pandas aligned by the uh, indices of the two uh, GDP is quarterly and CPI is monthly. So we've got all these missing values. Pandas has some methods to like drop missing values, fill missing values. We'll just drop these and then plot it. Um, so now we actually get our line. Yeah, so we fill an A, drop an A. Um, okay. This is going into that last step we did. Um, if you didn't have alignment, you would end up writing something like this. We'll see this, what this is doing. Uh, in the next notebook, but basically you're saying, okay, manually filtering down to just the common rows, right? So where index.month is divisible by three, so we get the same frequency on CPI, and then they start at different times and end at different times, so you have to make sure those align too. So, you know, this is what you'd do if you didn't have alignment, but since we do have alignment, it's as simple as just doing the division. Um, most pandas methods are, um, yeah, most pandas methods are, they don't mutate in place, pretty much every method, I think. So when you do real GDP dot drop in A, it'll return a new series, and real GDP will still have the missing values in it. So you'll need to assign that output of dot drop in A to a new data frame, or a data frame with the same name, and then you can get your result, okay? Uh, make plots. Um, there's an exercise here, if you want to go back later, you can try and recreate this, uh, this graph from calculated risk. Um, pandas, you know, it's like five lines or so to get that. Um, did I include the solutions? Whoops, um, that wasn't supposed to be in there. Uh, anyway, you can uh, maybe just look at this and then try and do it on yourself and then compare against the included solutions. Sorry about that. Um, but we will move on to the third notebook unless there are any questions on operations first. I don't know why it does that. So the third notebook is indexing, if you wanna go ahead and get that opened up. Indexing is like, I don't know, it's, it's probably one of the most complicated things in pandas, just because it tries to do so much um, if you think about lists, right, you can index by location, and that's it. You just pass in the number. Um, so pandas wants to support location with .iloc. Uh, you can, like with dictionaries, you can in, uh, index by key, and pandas supports that with .loc. Um, NumPy arrays, if you're familiar with those, you'll do a lot of Boolean indexing, so pandas supports that as well. Um, unlike lists or dictionaries, or at least dictionaries, Panda supports looking up by multiple items, by arrays of items, not just single keys. Um, you can also pass in slices, ranges, things like that. Um, and pandas also has this notion of hierarchical indexing where you have multiple levels in your index. So indexing pandas is a lot to help make selecting data easy. Um, it just makes things complicated sometimes. Uh, so the data set we'll be working with here is from this beeradvocate.com 
uh, data set of reviews. Uh, the raw data that I grabbed, um, I've only included a subset, so the raw data's like got all this, it's kind of a weird format. Um, and I've included this just because it's like one of my favorite features of Pandas is that it's in Python, so you get access to Python's great capabilities for processing uh, data like this. So, um, you know, this is a review uh, here, and then there's a blank line, and then the second review starts. So to get that into a form ready for a data frame, you'll be using like the regular Python libraries, uh, and then once it's in a tabular shape, you can read it into a data frame. So the data set was also pretty large. It didn't fit in memory. So the great thing about Python, Python 3 specifically, is that everything is lazy, so you can go through and you know, open up a file that doesn't actually fit in memory. You can you know, read in these reviews, but we haven't actually done anything yet since everything here is lazy, so partition by comes from tools, and all this is doing, I'll make this a tad smaller, is looking for those blank lines to separate the reviews, splitting on those, and then filtering out those lines that are just blank. We haven't actually done any work yet, right? This is all lazy. Um, this map in Python 3 is lazy, so we can use this format reviews. All that's doing is going from basically this to a dictionary where these are the keys and then these are the values. So that's all this is doing. Uh, you know, then we can partition it into chunks of 1,000, but we still haven't read anything into memory, right? You see the pattern here? Uh, and then only now when we start to iterate over the reviews, we get chunks of 100,000 reviews at a time. Okay, and these fit in memory. We can process them all. We can read them into a data frame using this little function I wrote here. And then we can write that out to disk. Okay, so that's like one of the best things about Pandas is written in Python. You have access to all these other great libraries. Um, this data set was also like just random. The row ordering was random. I wanted to get a sub slice of time. So to do that, um, I basically took like between the 50th and 60th percentile here. Um, but again, it didn't fit in memory. So using Dask, which is a project built on top of NumPy and Pandas and other libraries, um, you're able to operate on data frames that don't fit in memory. And I think Skipper is giving a little introduction to that uh, this afternoon. So maybe check out Dask if you're curious about working with larger than memory data sets. It's a really nice library. Um, okay, so the subset I included um, does fit in memory. So you can read in uh, that data frame in the cell uh, we got another option here, compression, so pandas can read compressed files, um, and we can take a look at the data. We have data, some data about the beer itself, metadata about the beer, and then the reviewer writes it on a few different scales, and then there's some metadata about the reviewer. Okay. Boolean indexing, I mentioned this before, so this is like a where, cl where clause in SQL. So give me the rows where the ABV is less than five. And the way you'll write that is either by passing it into get item. So you pass in this Boolean series into get item. Or you can pass it, uh, sorry, pass it into dot loc. And that, as the row indexer. So filter it down to these rows where ABV is less than five and then just give me these uh, columns. You can mix and match things here, uh, right? So conditions can just be joined up with the and or the or operators here, bitwise and, bitwise or. The only thing you have to be careful about is the order of operations here. So Python considers uh, greater than, less than, equal to have higher precedence than the bitwise and and or. So this is true, even though it shouldn't be, right, shouldn't. Uh, to fix that, you'll do the, the parentheses. So if you don't have, this is like a super common error, if you didn't have these first set of parentheses around this and, you'd get a very confusing message about doing these bitwise and not supported. So if you run into this, it's probably because you're missing parentheses. Okay, so for our first exercise here, um, we wanna find the rows where the beer style contains IPA. Um, so to do this, you'll need to use one method we haven't seen before, um, and that's this uh, dot stir, and I haven't given away the answer, but there's a method in this little namespace, Pandas does this with a few different things, like stir and date times. Um, if you have a column that is of string types, you'll have this dot stir namespace on here, 
and you can do things like stir.capitalize. Um, so these largely um, follow the Python, uh, Python string methods for the most part. So you'll use one of these methods to get the, that Boolean mask of rows that contain the string IPA, and then you can pass that into the indexer. So take like a minute or so to work on that. Select just the rows where the beer style contains IPA. And then you can follow that up with the next exercise where you find rows where the beer style is exactly American IPA or exactly Pilsner. So maybe a minute to work on those two. Any questions on Boolean indexing or anything? For this one, hopefully you found the stir.contains method. So look for rows that contain IPA. And then that's going to be a Boolean mask, which we can pass into get item. Okay. Questions on that one? For the second one, um, you'll be finding the ones that contain uh, American IPA or Pilsner. So we use regular equal equal here for American IPA. And then, or with the pipe, df.beer style equal equal Pilsner. Okay, so that's gonna be another Boolean array which you can pass to get item. Questions on those two? Yeah. Uh, which find? Uh, Stir.find, I'm assuming. Yeah, so the question was, what is df.beer style? Beer style dot stir dot find. So these are going to be, um, let's say, these are either string methods or reg regular expression methods. So these are like the re.find and re.find all from the regex library. Again, if you questions, can pull that up. Okay. Um, so ISN is another way of, basically, so these next couple sections, let's say, higher level, um, you know, uh, Boolean indexing is useful because so many different methods produce arrays of Booleans. So it's gonna, there are basically a lot of ways to filter down your data just to the exact way you need. So if you wanted to redo that last example, maybe you had like 10 different kinds of beer styles, you wouldn't want to write out all of these ors, right? Um, it'd be easier to use something like is in. So it's like a where beer style is in American IPA or Pilsner. So that's a bit more useful if you have a bunch of different things you're trying to filter down. So in this case, we'll look at um, like the top reviews, uh, the beers with the most number of reviews using this value counts. So what that does is uh, it'll return a, I'm gonna copy paste this out. It'll return a series where the keys are the brewer IDs, or sorry, the index labels are the brewer IDs, and then the values in the series are the actual counts, so the number of time that beer was reviewed. So that's what value counts is doing. So we did that for the brewer IDs and the beer IDs, um, and now you can filter it down saying, Okay, give me the rows where brewer ID is in brewer IDs, the top 10 brewer IDs, and where beer ID is in the top 10 beer IDs. So we get back this two-dimensional array. And so this one was in the top 10 brewer IDs. 
if you just pass this into get item, you'll probably get something you didn't expect or probably don't want. And so two-dimensional you know, Boolean indexing usually isn't what you want. Usually you want to uh, collapse that two-dimensional array of Booleans down into a one-dimensional series first um, with either saying, give me the rows where both the uh, brewer ID is in the top 10 and the beer ID is in the top 10. So you do that with this dot all operation. So what that does is collapses it across the columns and then only gives the, you know, is true where both were true and is false where either is false. Or you could use the dot any reduction method and this will give you, it, this row will be true where either was true. So again, anything that returns a Boolean array is potentially an indexer. Um, so for this one, we'll see another example of that. Um, find the rows where the reviews are all at least four. So you'll need to be select, uh, select those reviews and then use one of those collapse, those reduction methods in your all to collapse that down to a single uh, dimension and then pass that into get item. And you can also work on the next exercise. We'll give a couple minutes for these. Select the rows where the average is at least four. Just say again, just at a high level, we're getting these Boolean arrays and collapsing them down to a single level. So there's a bunch of reduction methods that can be used here. So for this first one, selecting where, first of all, we have DF uh, review calls, so just these rows, uh, where these rows are all at least four. So we can say, you know, is each of these elements greater than four? Just give us back that, you know, four columns, and then, or five, uh, and then we want to do dot all of one or dot all of columns to collapse that. So reduction methods in general, the way to remember it is it, you know, is it zero or one? Basically, you pass in the column that you, or sorry, the dimension that you want to remove. So this will remove the column's dimension. And then you can use that as the indexer. For the second exercise there, uh, where the average of the uh, reviews is at least four. So again, first of all, you can say uh, DF of review calls dot mean, and again, columns, so take the mean along the first dimension, and this gives us the series, the average for that row, greater than four, so now we have a Boolean mask, and that we can pass into get item. Okay, questions on those two? Okay, again, the high level thing to remember is anything that returns a Boolean array can be a Boolean indexer. All right, um, hierarchical indexing. So this is uh, getting into one of the more complicated things. Um, the set index method will take a column or a list of columns and move them down into the index. So this is a multi-index now. And these can be useful for like keeping metadata out of your data frame, um, just so like it doesn't get mixed up in operations or anything like that. It's also used for, useful for aligning things that maybe apply to like the profile name. You have like a series of just profile names and some data with that. Um, and then being able to join that to this uh, kind of higher dimensional thing uh, with, for the reviews table. So multi-indices are useful, but again, they can be complicated. Usually you want to sort them, so you can use the sort index method. Um, and say we wanted to select the top reviewers by label. So we'll get the top reviewers using just the value counts again. 
selecting the index. So these are the profiles with the most reviews. And the way this works is you'll pass in the, uh, the labels that you want to select. So this is a list or array of labels. And then use the regular Python colon for representing the rest. So NumPy uses this as well. So select the rest of the columns. So all of these columns, basically. Or sorry, all of these uh, from this uh, level of the multi-index. And again, um, you know, you have to be careful with the syntax. If you wanted to look up like a single one um, like this, uh, this is invalid syntax because you can't put the colon in these, inside these parentheses. You can only use colon in certain places. So pandas provides this index slice kind of helper thing to generate the correct uh, slice that you need. So we can select just the top reviewers for beer ID 99 and any time. So this can be quite useful, and we'll see it in the next section on group by. Um, I think we'll skip over the rest of this. You can read through it if you run into chained indexing problems, but uh, just for time, we'll jump into the fourth notebook, group by and reshaping. Again. And we're using the same data set there. Just as a kind of example of what's possible, you can say, okay, give me the reviews, all right, the count of each review is kind of grouped by kind, uh, you know, review, appearance, aroma, overall. This is using Seaborn. And this is kind of common. You'll be using things like stack and unstack um, and melt uh, to be basically getting your data into the correct form for whatever API is expecting it. So count plot kind of wants this long form of stack data, which we'll see in a second. Um, but being able to transition between wide and long to reshape your data is pretty important to work with all the different APIs that you'll be coming into contact with. Um, so group by, I think, you know, it's pretty important. Maybe I don't need to explain why, but just being able to uh, calculate things on subsets of your data at a time, um, independent from the rest, is a fairly common operation. And the way Pandas likes to talk about it is a three-stage thing where you split your table into groups by some method. Um, you, apply some, you apply some function to each of the groups independently, and then you combine the results somehow. So the first step, the split, looks like df.groupby and then grouper, where grouper can be like a series or a column label, um, a function to operate on the index, dictionary, levels, so lots of options there. We'll see a few of those. Um, so we'll, in this case, we'll just say df.group by beer style. So we'll be operating on each beer style independently. This gr, this group by object, hasn't actually really done anything yet. It's just recording some information about which rows go with which group, basically. And then the last two steps, um, you can say, okay, apply the mean function, and this egg that egg is saying aggregate, that's kind of hinting how it should be combined. Pandas handles that combination step the, to combine everything back together and this with this. So basically, egg is saying, give me one row per group. Okay. So you can, you know, do a lot of things. You can slice this group by object, so if we just want it, are interested in the review columns, so we can select those and then aggregate them again. Get a, a, the dot attribute access looks, works just like on a series, so you can say gr if you just want to look at abv. And then finally, the shortest way to write it is gr.abv.mean. So these methods are also attached to, uh, to the data frame, or sorry, the group by object. Okay. So first exercise here, um, find the beer styles with the greatest variance or standard deviation in ABV. So you'll need to, first of all, calculate that. So you can use either STD or VAR to get the standard deviation, and then sort values to sort the values. I think uh, 30 seconds or so on that. Questions on group by? Make sense?
I said it took us a while to come up with this name, and that's not actually a joke. It really did take us a while to come up with sort values. Naming things is hard. So getting the standard deviation, or you could use variance, it would be the same outcome. Um, and then sort values. Um, and we'll want, I don't, it doesn't matter, but we say ascending equal false to have largest to smallest. So these are the reviews with the most variance there. Questions on that? Yeah, so the question was, what was ABV? Um, that's a column in the data frame, ABV, uh, alcohol, <laughs> alcohol by volume or something, I don't know. It's measured the alcohol content. Um, and so just like on series where you can do df.abv, you can also do that on group by objects. So df.group by beer style dot ABV. Right, so this is just a series group by object. By volume, is it? Okay, alcohol by volume. Good to know. Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, this next section is kind of getting down into the weeds, but there's like a ton of combinations for group by. It's extremely flexible. Um, for, you know, what you should expect for the output shape, it kind of depends on a few things. So the grouper, we just group by a single column, but you can also group by multiple columns. And if you have multiple columns, you'll get back a multi-index. So we'll see that in a second. Uh, the thing being operated on, the group E, you might say, is going to control the, the values in the data frame. So it's either going to be a single column if you're operating on a single column. Or, sorry, if, it'll be a single column if you have a uh, single aggregation and multiple columns if you have uh, multiple aggregations, which is the next step. We've only seen a single aggreg aggre ah, aggregation so far, but you can also apply multiple aggregation functions at the same time. So in this case, right, we have a single uh, thing that we're groupy, right? Single groupy, and then aggregating with mean. You can also use functions like np.std, anything that returns a single value, uh, counts, so things like that. So we get back a data frame here with a single index, right, since we still are just using that one group by beer style. Um, and we can, you know, just go through all these. It might be more useful to look back later, but. Uh, you know, selecting multiple columns, single aggregation gives us back a data frame. Um, multiple aggregations on multiple columns, so this will return a data frame with a hierarchical index in the columns. Everyone see that? So it applies, you know, it looks at just, first of all, the review appearance, applies all three ag funks, and then goes to the next column, applies all three ag funks. So these can be a bit awkward to work with, so typically I'll use stack to move one of these levels down into the index. So in this case, we move this topmost level from the columns down to the index with stack. And that level equals zero is saying take the outermost column. So now the, the beer style, or sorry, the, the review, appearance, aroma, whatever, is now a uh, level in the multi-index in the row labels. Um, if you have multi-index, it's also oftentimes useful to group by, say, one of those levels. So now we can say group by this level, just this outermost beer style level. And looking just at the mean column, we can select the min and the max. So now we have the min and the max average review by beer style. Okay, so you can do a lot of complicated things there. Yeah, question? Sure, um, so this is saying, maybe it'd be easier if I wrote it like, um, I'm gonna collect this thing first. Uh, okay, so you have this multi-dimensional thing in the columns, and we can either move the outermost level or the inner level, so uh, if we do multi.stack, this is gonna, so in general, stack moves everything down. Um, I thought, oh, by default, it's just the, Innermost level, okay. 
uh, sorry, I was mistaken there. Um, so dot stack will move down one of the columns, or one of the levels of the multi-index in the columns down into the index. So we want the outermost level, which is zero. You can also do one. You can also do negative indexing, so the innermost level, things like that. But what it's, yeah. Um, the default would be minus one, which is the innermost level, which happens to be one in this case, since there's two levels, right? That's the same. But yeah, in general, stack is moving things from the columns down into the index. And if you do stack again, it'll keep going. Any other questions? That's it, like, yeah, so that stuff, I don't rem expect you to remember all that, because there's so many different options. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of power there. Um, okay, exercise here. Um, plot the relationship between the review length and the average review overall. So again, split this up. First thing you need is a grouper, right? Before we were just grouping by beer style, now we're grouping by something else. So we need to calculate that series that we need to group by, which in this case is the length, the LEN, of each row. Group by that series. Select just review overall, take the mean, and then plot that. And you might want to use this style equal a k dot to get a reasonable looking plot. Let's take a minute or so on that. If you have any questions, let me know. You'll kind of see this. Pandas likes to encourage small methods, each one that does you know, a particular thing, and then you can chain these small methods together to get your actual answer. Just so you're not entirely lost. Before we were doing DF that group by beer style. You can also pass in a series, which is what you'll be doing in this case. So we don't have this series yet. This is what you're going to pass into group by, and you need to calculate that. So the first step, getting that length, we have the full text of the review in df.text. We'll look at .stir and do the .stir.len method. So that calculates the length of each string, uh, length of each review. So that's the thing we're going to group by. And then we will take just review overall. and then calculate the mean. So this is the average review overall grouped by the length of the reviews. And again, you can plot that with uh, style equal k dot and get your plot. So you know it's useful to be able to build these up um, as you go. And you can break this out. Like this is a lot of logic right in the middle of the function call. It's a bit complicated, but you could break this out into a separate step if you wanted. Questions on that? I think we'll skip over the next exercise. It's basically the same thing. Um, these stir methods are flexible, so you can group by like regular expressions, things like that. Um, I think we'll skip over that though. Um, maybe skip this one as well. Uh, also going to skip this. Like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, don't quite have time to get to, but you can do some pretty, pretty impressive things. Pretty succinctly, I think. Um, so transform is a, so I should say, you know, we have this data frame dot group by, um, and then we've only looked at ag so far. Um, that's kind of like one of the three kinds of things, um, trans oh, one of the three kinds of ways you can um, operate on a group by object. So ag returns one row re per result. Transform will return a, an identically shaped output as the input, and then apply, you can just do whatever you want. It's extremely flexible. Um, so for transform, this is useful, like, if you wanted to, like, do a recommendation system or something, maybe you want to kind of uh, demean everyone's reviews by their own personal reviews. 
So you know, we can do that with the entire data frame by passing in using this function, right, and taking the review minus the average. So this D, D means the entire series of review overall. You can apply that function to each group with the transform method. Um, this is a long line. I'm gonna break this up quick. Uh, so select uh, just review overall, grouping by profile name, so each individual, selecting just review overall, and then transforming according to that D mean function. And then the output of this will be identical to the input shape. So you, you can just select, uh, you can just put it back into the, uh, as a new column in DF. So, you know, even though this first review is the same for these two people, um, this one was a lot more, um, I guess, meaningful. This 4.5 is a lot more higher than this person's 4.5 because um, his, I guess, tend to be higher on average than the first person's. So transform is useful if you want to do group-wise operations but get back a same shaped object. Finally, apply we'll talk about in the next notebook. Time series um, has some special methods, uh, group by like methods on them. So this is a data set of flights um, and we can get like the departure time, okay, doing value counts. This is that like a second or minute frequency which maybe isn't so useful. You can plot it but you know, who really cares how many left at this exact minute. Um, so in that case maybe we want to resample to a different frequency. Um, so this resampler is kind of like a group by object. It hasn't really done anything yet. Um, we just changed the API, so um, yeah. Uh, now it's like this group by object. You can ignore this warning. Which you can do methods on like dot mean. And then you can plot it. So this is now resampled to an hourly frequency. You could also write this as a group by like by going through and calculating the hour attribute of each of those rows, but it's much simpler to just use this resample syntax. So again, that maybe not too useful. You can also do multiples of hours, so like 3H. So resample to three hours, aggregate, so for each three hour bin, select the mean. Um, you can do different aggregations, so we can resample to daily and take the sum. Pretty flexible here. There's also these rolling objects which will, in a similar way, it'll give you a, a group by like object, this rolling of seven. Again, hasn't done anything, but you can do aggregations on it. I mean, you can plot it. Okay, so group by is, you know, just for general things and then for like time series stuff you can use dot uh, resample is usually what you want. Okay, any questions on that? I know we're going fast, I wanted to get to the next notebook though. I think we have like 25 minutes left. Uh, seven is, uh, seven, well, so this happened to be daily data. Uh, um, daily, right, is gonna have one row per day. And then that says, uh, take a rolling, a seven whatever period rolling window. So seven day in this case. Any other questions? Okay, this will be the last notebook. I think the most important, perhaps. So if you want to get that opened up. It's gonna be talking about uh, tidy data, which is a way of, well, it's two things. It's a way of structuring your data. It's also a way of kind of thinking about how to do data analysis. Uh, the way Hadley Wickham, who's a author of a lot of R packages, likes to describe it is um, structuring data sets to facilitate analysis. And that, yeah, that's a very succinct way of putting it. Um, the rules for a tidy data set that we'll be concerned with are each variable should form a column and each observation should form a row. Um, so we'll see an example of this next. Uh, I grabbed some data from this website. It's just got, uh, using the pandas read HTML, so this will do like basic scraping of tables. Um, if it's like really badly formatted HTML, then you might have to use something like beautiful soup, but um, read HTML will do okay. And the data set itself is kind of messy. There's like 
these random columns that don't have names. There's these rows each month kind of gets its like header row inside the table. So um, it's kind of messy. Um, but the question this Stack Overflow person was asking, you know, he had this data set and he was asking, okay, um, how many days of rest did each team get between each game? So, question, do we have a tidy data set? Can we answer that question with a data set that looks like this? What do you think? Would I be asking you? Yeah, Greg. No, we do not have a tidy data set. What would a tidy data set look like to answer this question? What do we need? What, is our, what are our rows? Each team's games? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, those are the two components there. There's gonna be a team and a game. So those two pairs together, game being like the date. That's what we can use to calculate the days of rest between for, for each team, which we don't have, right? Here we have a date and then we have two teams. So our team is spread across two columns. Okay, so before we can even get to the tidying part, we just have some general stuff of doing, and this is pretty common pandas code, I think. If you have a messy data set, you'll do a bunch of stuff, like a data import time. So reading it into CSV, fixing up the column names, this drop in A is getting rid of the rows, like this October month header. So get rid of those rows, select these columns, create this new, or whatever, overwrite the column, date to be um, to be an actual date time it's using this weird format. Uh, setting the index, appending date to the index, and then fixing up the index names. So this is pretty idiomatic pandas, I think. And you get this data frame, which still isn't tidy, but it's at least been cleaned up a little bit. To actually get the tidy data set, those team game pairs, we'll use this melt function, which comes from uh, I think reshape to one of Hadley's packages. Um, basically, same thing. So the way melt works, it's I, I have to look at the documentation every time because it does a lot, but it does exactly what we need in this case. So the basic idea is ID vars, these are things that you want to repeat enough times to stay with each observation. So these are like the metadata, which game ID and date. We need to repeat this date enough times to stay with each of the teams which in this case is two. So we have to repeat that date twice. Uh, value vars, that's gonna be the things that you're, is currently spread out and you want stacked into a single row. Okay, so you can't just use stack here, right? Because that just moves things from the index down. Um, it, it wouldn't handle this repeating the metadata that needs to be repeated. So melt does exactly what we need. And now that we have the tidy data set, we can just answer our question, like without too much effort. Um, you just need to know like that pandas has this diff method that does exactly what we need. But I think this is fairly clear what's going on. We're grouping by team, we're taking the date and then differencing that, and then selecting the days and subtracting one to get the rest. So this part here gives us the days between two subsequent games for each team, and then subtracting one. So the group by is nice because then you don't have to deal with like okay, what if I get to the last game for a team or the first game for a team? Group I handles that, it'll introduce the NANs. Any questions on that operation there? So we wouldn't have been able to do that on the original data set, at least not easily, it, it would have been really messy. Um, so now we can assign that operation as this rest variable, we have our rest, and if you wanted to get back to that original data set, you can use something like pivot table. So you can pass in the tidy data set. The value we're operating on is rest. We want these two index columns to match our original data frame. And then columns, you can call it variable, and then rename things. So this is just going from the tidy data set back to our original data set. So one thing that might not be clear is the the definition of tidy, like your definition of an observation, depends on the question you're trying to answer. So we had a team level question, right? What was each team's uh, rest for each game? But if you want to answer questions like, um, you know, like this is a game level statistic, I need to run that cell, this is a game level statistic, um, 
this plot takes a while, sorry. So you can answer team level questions like this with our tidy data set. So Seaborn's just going through each team, plotting the average rest at home and then the average rest away for each team. You can also answer game level statistics like this. So what was the difference in rest for each head-to-head -head matchup? So we have two data sets now and whether or not it's tidy depends on our question. Okay. Stack and unstacked, uh, whoops, uh, go down here. Um, they're just useful for converting between APIs. So we saw it a bit before, but um, more formally, the rest here is gonna be in a long form. So basically, you know, it's, it's all stacked up into one column with like labels for each thing over here. Um, some things like pandas.plot expects wide form data. So, you know, we can again do like a rolling, a 14 week, I guess, day rolling average of uh, average rest, things like that. So it's, it's useful to be able to go between things that expect long form data and wide form data since not all APIs are designed the same. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got 15 minutes left, which is maybe enough time. Um, the rest of this notebook is like a little project that I'll let you all work on. Um, I'll be walking around if you have questions, but um, basically examining home team advantage. So, you know, using this head-to-head -head matchup, um, you know, what are the determinants of home team advantage? So befitting a regression that looks like this, if you haven't used, we're, we're gonna use stats models. Um, if you haven't used it, I've coded that up, so that's fine. Um, you just have to get the data to the point where this cell actually runs. And I've kind of laid out how I would approach that, um, but you're free to go your own way, do it however you want. So um, take 15 minutes, and, or I guess maybe like uh, 10 minutes or so, so that we can wrap in the last five minutes, but um, take 10 minutes, try and work on this, see how far you can get. Um, I think it's a good little project of re reshaping, manipulating data, getting you to where you need to go, and then I'll take five minutes at the end to run through the example quick, okay? Questions before we get to that? All on the same page? Okay. Uh, and feel free to work together. Uh, this chat room is extremely empty. But hey, that's okay. Uh, if you have questions, you can post them in there. Uh, yeah. Go forth and do data, and I'll collect you in about 10 minutes or so, which I think might be enough time for some. And then that'll be it. We will not get to the last notebook, unfortunately.
Anybody have success with the first step, calculating the win percent? Probably the hardest step, actually, unfortunately. Similar to what we did before with the, uh, with the rest, we're going to use melt. But instead of melting down the dates and the teams, we're going to be melting down the, uh, whether or not the home team won. So oh, I need to fill this out, or I'm actually going to delete that and load my solution. So melting down the value bars, home team, away team, so that's the thing that's spread out across, um, and then var name, home or away. So the thing that changed here is we also want to attach this home win. So this is like another bit of metadata that needs to get repeated. So we have these games. Um, we need a new column for whether or not the team in that row is the team that won. So to get that, we need them to be either the home team and the home team won, or the away team and the home team lost. So figuring out, is this the row, is this row the winner for that game? So um, you could do that in a couple ways. Uh, doing this triple equal equal um, is the correct logic, I think. So is the team that won home, and then is the actual home or away equal to home team? So this gives us uh, a column with whether or not the, you know, the Atlanta Hawks, they lost this first game. Chicago Bulls won it. Good for them. Uh, aggregate that. So, well, do my solution here. Um, aggregate that with this, um, so this ag, we, we haven't seen this syntax yet, but if you pass a dictionary of keys are gonna be the output column names, and then the values are gonna be the aggregation function. So you can also just pass in like the regular list, sum, count, mean, and then do a rename. So now we have a data frame where we have two rows per team, right, home and away, and then we have the number of games they played, the number of wins they had, and the 1%. Um, pause to see, okay, are we on the right track here? Is there even a relationship between uh, home team, is there, is there a home team advantage, basically? And it kind of looks like there is, so there's a positive relationship there. This is plotting whether or not the team is home or away, uh, and then we have the one line, basically, for each team, and most of these are positive, so mo most teams do do better at home, so we're, we're on the right track here, I think. Then we can calculate win percent. Um, I don't actually know. I did it this way by taking the sum of the wins divided by the sum of the games played. You probably just do the average of win percent if they play the same number home and away. So now we have a win percent per team. So this is like a team strength variable. That's what we'll throw into our regression. It's really bad that we're doing that because now we have win on the left side of the regression and on the right side, but Oh well, we'll work with it. Um, so calculating, uh, ba yeah, basically setting up our final data frame for the regression. So we have um, taking this win percent and getting it into the data frame. So doing that with map. So df dot away team is just going to be a series of team names. Win percent is a series of uh, win percents where the index labels are the team names. And what MAP will do is it'll look up, okay, for Atlanta Hawks, it'll look up uh, what, or yeah, it'll look up the keys basically by name and then insert the value um, from this win percent. So now we have our home and away win percents. Uh, we can calculate the difference in points. We can calculate the difference in rest. And now we can finally fit our model. And stats models will go ahead and do that. This is a formula we're fitting, home win as a function of all these other strength functions and then rest, and you can interpret re your results as you will. So um, I don't know what the determinant, so the team strength definitely does matter, but again, we're, you know, that's because it's on both sides of the equation, so that's kind of bad, but that's okay. Um, rest does maybe not seem to matter as much, at least once you've controlled for strength, so. Um, so that is that, I think. Are there any questions before we break? Okay. Cool. 
Well, I'll be around the uh, rest of the conference. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. Uh, I'm more than happy to help out. So yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.